Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Irvi. Today I will be presenting about Tracing Simplify and introductions to microservices observability uh, with Dapper. So next, this is more about me. Currently, I'm a master's student in data science at the University of Edinburgh. I'm also a CNCF ambassador, and my past experience mostly mostly related to software engineering. Um, this is my previous employer. Uh, there is like Motional, Spotify, and then Volca. And this is today's agenda. First, I want to have some kind of like introductions to observability. Next, we will try to kind of like understand tracing. And the third one will be uh, some kind of like a reminder or overview about Dapper. Next, we will try to kind of like implement tracing with Dapper. Uh, for the last thing will be Q&A sessions and closing remarks. And this is more about like introductions to observability. So we often heard about um, observability in distributed system and uh, microservices, right? So why we often heard about these things? What's the importance for like observability to come into the picture? So observability is actually the key in managing complex microservices architecture because it can provide insight into how different parts of the system are performing and interacting. And effective observability actually helps in identifying and resolving issues quickly, ensuring the system reliability and performance. And there is like three different components uh, for observability. The first one is metrics. Metrics is more like numerical data that can provide insights into the performance of the system. Example includes re response time, error rates, and resource utilizations. Second one is logs. Logs are records of events that occurs within applications, and this usually come uh, into the picture when we are trying to debug and then try to kind of like understand the system behavior over time. Next, we have tracing. Tracing actually tracks the journey of a request across various microservices. And it helps in identifying bottlenecks and understanding the flow of requests through the system. So what's the benefit of observability? It will bring confidence, especially in a complex cloud environment. It can also improve organizational alignment. For example, uh, we have a request to try to kind of like improve the system or we get like a feedback from the users that um, our system is getting slower, right? To be able to narrow down what kind of like um, things that actually uh, become a bottleneck, we need to gather more data. And um, by using a tracing, we can actually or uh, observability in general, we can uh, narrow down the components that causing like the slow responses and how we can actually uh, get like a faster feedback loop when try to kind of like Im improve our system performance. And because it's easier for us to narrow down problems when an issue is actually happening, so it will also help us uh, in the terms of like preventing unnecessary downtime or making like a downtime is kind of like longer because we, we don't know how to kind of like pinpoint the problems that actually happening across our system. Next, uh, we want to kind of like understand uh, what actually tracing is. So traces actually shows uh, the request path. They tracks where the request actually goes and which parts of the system it interacts with. Traces actually resemble logs, but they are kind of like a special kind of logs which records each step of a request journey. And traces reveals uh, work details. They show how much work is done at each step of the system. And traces actually maintain the order. They are using a special rule called uh, happens before semantics to keep the events in correct sequence, showing which actions lead to the others. In short, traces are like storybooks that narrate the entire journey of a request through a different parts of the system. 
from start to finish and in the correct order. So this is like example on uh, how a sample request um, actually works, right? Imagine that we have uh, four different components which are being represented as alphabets here, A, B, C, and D, and then we have one external component, which is Redis, that being called by surface B. Uh, we can see that the uh, uh, request actually started from A, and it will uh, actually chaining down into external dependencies, which is Redis, and then uh, other components like C, B, and D. And then next, we will end up with like various informations for each of the uh, step invocations, as well as the total um, like journey between like um, the first uh, incoming request to the result. And the first component uh, of the distributed system set being touched here during the life cycle, the life cycle of a request actually represented as a direct and cyclic graph. And this is how trace actually looks like. A trace is actually represented as spans. Uh, we can see here span A is actually root span and span B is a child of span E. So whenever a request uh, is actually like coming, then we will generate a new uh, span here. And uh, we can gather like informations from each of the span and propagate it back to like the root span. Uh, just we will get like the whole trace. Uh, so what is the challenges when we try to kind of like do tracing? Um, first one is complexity because there is a distributed nature of microservices that can make tracing actually challenging as a single transaction may span multiple services. And then second one is consistency. Ensuring consistent and accurate data collections across different services is crucial but difficult because uh, it will add more complexities when, when we try to um, collect all of the information that we need. Next, we will have like overhead because implementing tracing can actually add overhead to the system which needs to be managed uh, effectively to avoid bottleneck on the tracing system itself. So um, we have like Dapper into the picture right now, right? So Dapper actually allows us to um, use any code or frameworks to our liking and then perform HTTP API or gRPC API to access service implications, set management, uh, messaging broker, Actual secrets, configurations, and so on by using the Dapper uh, runtime. And then we can deploy this on top of any cloud or edge infrastructure like Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, Alibaba, Kubernetes, virtual, or even physical machine. Such is actually uh, really flexible for us to um, do things to our liking, right? And then how actually this distributed tracing works in Dapper? Imagine that we have like two different surface components here called A and B. And for each surfaces, it will be connected into uh, its own sidecar container, which in turn are running Dapper, Dapper right? So when, when we are creating like a surface invocations or uh, trying to do some kind of like events, then Dapper will release this um, or will emit this tracing uh, into like any monitoring tools that we want to use. For example, like Zipkin, Jaker, New Relic, or any kind of like vendors like Datadog and so on. And yeah, for uh, the monitoring, from the monitoring tools, we can visualize how the chain of call from like a single request is uh, actually happening or interacting with each others. We also can get uh, uh, informations or like can infer the informations on when we actually uh, having some kind of like extra dependence. In this form, it's actually a pops up component uh, by using a Kafka. 
So uh, we already know on how distributed tracing in depth actually works, right? It's actually using the double runtime on each of the sidecar container attached to each of the surfaces. Um, how it is actually being generated by Dapper? Uh, if you are using Dapper, uh, you will get these features by default, meaning that Dapper will generate the uh, trace for you. And it will be in the form of W3C tracing specifications, which is actually included as a part of open telemetry or OTEL, and Dapper will be the one that actually generate and propagate the context header for the applications. Or if let's say you are uh, sending a request from a non-Dapper environment, then it will propagate any kind of like custom user provided context header um, and put it into like any monitoring tools of our liking which is quite flexible because you don't need to migrate all of your services into like a dapper environment. But if let's say you you want to kind of like implement or like uh, incrementally um, changing your system by creating, for example, like still using the legacy system and creating your own like user provided context headers for the spans and then uh, calling like uh, latest services which actually using Dapper, you can still pass this information to like your uh, latest system. Next, uh, what kind of like scenarios that being supported by Dapper? So Dapper, uh, as we already know, right? Dapper will generate the trace context and there might or might not be a need for you to propagate the trace context to another services. If let's say you, you want to use the same spans for multiple services, then you will need to kind of like propagate the context header by your own. But if let's say you decide just kind of like let each of the surface communications to have its own span, then there is no need for you to kind of like propagate the uh, context header by yourself. And if let's say you decide to generate a trace context um, from outside of a uh, Dapper environment and then doing some kind of like system invocations to your Dapper runtime, then you can actually generate this trace context by using a standard open telemetry SDK. Any kind of like vendor SDK or W3C trace context that you can create by your own. And um, yeah, so uh, how actually tracing context looks like? There is two different um, things that actually exist um, within like um, tracing context in order to be able to support interoperability and vendor specific extensibility. The first one is transparency. Transparency actually describes the positions of the incoming requests in its trace graph in a portable fixed length format. So every tracing tool must properly set transparency, even when it only relies on vendor specific information in trace state. Trace state extends transparent with vendor specific data represented by a set of name and value pairs. This um, Trace state is actually uh, optional, right? This is more like adding any kind of like additional information that you want to have on your trace. Next, how trace pairs actually looks like. So there is like four different informations that you will have inside of like trace pairs. The first one is versions, trace ID, parent ID, and trace flex. Uh, and it will be in the forms of like past 16, a format, you can see that uh, each of the information that we will have here is separated by a dash. And for the trace flags, it is kind of like sampled by the uh, trace generation itself. And next, uh, this is how trace state actually looks like. The trace state will contain any kind of like opaque values in any forms of like keys and values pair. So let's say we want to kind of like add two different keys and values pair here, then uh, it will actually uh, 
being like presented as like OPEC values without any kind of like uh, any need to decode it into another part. So we already know that if let's say we want to uh, for for some kind of like custom usage, right? We we want to kind of like uh, pass through uh, a same spans offer several different services. We will need to pass the uh, context header by ourselves. First one, we will need of course the trace parents, right? Because it is needed for all of different services to sorry for all of different faces to have like transparent headers. And if we want to, we also can get the trace state headers. So that's only two things that we need. Um, and the header name is actually just the same as the W3C uh, schema that we already discussed before. And for the gRPC instead of like Dapper, it will have different headers. And the header name is actually gRPC trace bin header. So uh, we will have here a quick start for self hosted node. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, I can't do any kind of like demos because uh, somehow it, there is some kind of like problems with my laptop. So this is actually being taken from a quick start from Dapper. Um, and code is actually written in Python. And we don't actually need to do anything for for the sake of like emitting the traces by ourselves. What we need, of course, is having like a Dapper installed on our environment. And we will need to kind of like run Dapper in it, which will generate YAML configuration file. If let's say we run it in the Unix like environment, it will be within our home slash dot Dapper slash config dot YAML. And if we run it for Windows, then we will have it inside of like our user profile uh, backslash dot Dapper backslash config dot YAML. And this is like the content of uh the configurations um and it will by default using a zip pin and we will need to kind of like provide the endpoint address and this is like the default configurations that we will have and next we will need to kind of like launch the open zip pin, uh docker container because it is where we will actually push all of our phrases and we will be able to kind of like get uh visualizations for our traces here. And if let's say the applications is being launched by Dapper Run, um, and this Dapper Run will by default reference the config file uh, within like our environment. Of course, it's uh, if it's kind of like Unix-like, then it will be on our home. And if it's kind of like Windows, then it will be within our user profile. And if let's say we decide to kind of like override the configurations, we only need to kind of like pass this test config param, and we will need to kind of like clone the quick start repository. And after that, we need to run the uh, the code. There is some kind of like Python code and then Node.js code as well. And once the app is actually running, we need to make a service invocations using Dapper info. Uh, with a uh, provided uh, request content um, within the repository. And next, uh, if let's say we already do the invocations, then we can actually get the uh, um, get the traces from like our visualization tools, which is using the Zipkin. Uh, Open can right? Uh, there is two different mechanism in order to kind of like access the uh, Open Zipkin. The first one is of course using the Zipkin UI, which can be accessed within the local host uh, with the port of nine four zero one one, right? And then we can also uh, calling the Zipkin by using Zipkin API using a call, and we need to kind of like uh specify the spend name um and then uh we'll output uh, it into the output that you saw and we can take a look into what kind of information that we will have within this um result right first one is of course like the trace id a kind uh name and then we will 
get some kind of like information, like service name, of course, and uh, API endpoint, which being accessed uh, when we are using that per info. The status code protocol and the subscriptions and so on. Yeah, so basically that's it. And if let's say we decide to kind of like use Kubernetes on like a cloud infrastructure, then we should make sure that the uh, Kubernetes cluster already have like Docker installed. And we are ensuring that each of like our services have a Docker um, sidecar container to kind of like emit the traces. And we can also configure on what kind of like get tools that we want to have as the monitoring tools in general. Okay, so basically that's it. And there is like a few Dapper resources that you can access. First one is of course documentations within Dapper.io. And we also have like a channel called Dapper in YouTube. And this is like the tutorial that uh, we discussed in the sessions, which is like Dapper Quick Starts. And we also have like a Discord for Dapper community. And the uh, last but not least is a X account uh, for Dapper, which is Dapper Dev. Okay, if there is any kind of like questions, uh, feel free to um, like ask it in the chat. Uh, yeah, basically that's it. Thank you for your time.